Kia ora tata, everybody. Uh, Bruce Harrell's my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit and head of the Department of General Practice and Primary Healthcare. Uh, we've got a great program for you tonight. And this has been uh, sponsored by the Northern Regional Health Coordination Centre. And I'd like to introduce Andrew Old, his clinical lead, planning intelligence for the COVID-19 response. And he's going to provide an update on the COVID-19 data, current modelling and what 2022 might look like. And we're hope hopefully going to give you an optimistic view of what's going to happen next year. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, and Kia ora koutou, everybody. This is the, this is the picture of the outbreak um, that we're currently dealing with. Um, you can see that the good news is really, as you will all know, that um, cases have been coming down. We peaked uh, sort of in mid-November and have been coming down since then. Um, that is faster than we had forecast that we would come down. The blue line on this graph is the moving three-day average of cases, uh, and the two shaded areas are the projections. The, the orange shaded area um, here, this was our sort of original projection, and then this upper projection was one that Tapuna Mastini did. Uh, so you can see we were expecting to stay sort of up through December and actually cases have dropped away faster than we expected they would. Um, the key message here is really that cases and hospitalizations have thankfully been lower than forecast over the past few weeks. You can see some of the actual numbers there, um, but just in the last week we were had 51 fewer cases and about 33 fewer hospitalizations than we were expecting, um, which is obviously a, a good a good news heading into Christmas. So just looking briefly at hospitalizations, that's the, the curve. So the bars are the actual, so blue bars are the hospitalized cases, orange bars are ICU, and then the forecasts are the dotted blue line and the solid orange line. And you can see that for both hospitalizations and for ICU cases, we were consistently below <clears throat> where we expected to be and expect that to continue to tail off towards the end of the year. Um, Average length of stay has been coming down. It's about um, uh, three days for the whole outbreak and just under three days outside ICU for the last week. Um, and uh, what's interesting now is we're getting a few long stays in ICU that are starting to skew the data. So you'll see um, overall length of stay for ICU has been about 16 days. Um, but just in the last week, people in ICU have been there um, on average uh, 27 days. But just a few slides on the demography of the current outbreak and how it's been changing. So two graphs uh, here. The top one is the, um, this is cases over time. So you can see here, this is the original uh, part of the outbreak where we had um, a lot of Pacific cases and the super spreader events through, through the AOG church. Uh, here through September, where we thought we were getting on top of things. Uh, and then a change where we started going up again uh, sort of in October and the, or, uh, the red line here, this is, these are Māori cases really making up the bulk of those uh, cases more recently um, and thankfully coming down quite steeply now. Um, you see the change in proportion uh, well illustrated on this, in this figure here. <clears throat> Again, Pacific cases predominantly at the beginning, uh, then a transition and then Māori cases, uh, about 50%, over 50% of cases have been Māori in the last month. Interestingly, that's now starting to converge again between uh, Pacific and Māori cases. Uh, average age, people will be aware that this is a young outbreak. Um, so the average age uh, is about 30 for all ethnicities uh, and Māori and Pacific cases consistently younger. The average age for Māori cases about 25 uh, and Pacific just a little bit older than that. Uh, what that doesn't show you is the age distribution, which is on the next uh, slide here, uh, which really makes very stark the number of young people, uh, particularly very young uh, children who've been affected by this outbreak. So the orange bars here are Māori cases and you just see you know, under 10s here. So one in five of all cases uh, to date uh, have been under the age of 10. That's one in four for Māori cases. Uh, and the shape of the Māori cases here you see um, is an interesting sort of line like this. So much more predominant in younger age groups, uh, and then which is a different shape even to the Pacific curve there and certainly for the other curve as well. Um, 
partly a testament to vaccination uh, that less than 6% of cases have been over the age of 60, uh, which is quite remarkable, really. And uh, about 50% of cases uh, from quintile five. <clears throat> So lots of numbers on this slide, but really just want you to look at the column in the middle here. And this is to make the point that despite what feels like a lot of COVID around, uh, we are still and have returned to what we would consider internationally a low prevalence. Uh, so the scale on the left-hand side here uh, suggests that we're calling low prevalence, a prevalence of less than one in 5,000 in the population uh, having COVID, medium low, uh, one in a thousand to one in five thousand, medium one in a hundred to one in a thousand, and high one in a hundred or higher um, in the UK at the moment, as an example, um, the prevalence is, is higher than one in a hundred. And so you can see that for us, um, although counties would still be in the medium low, this is based on last week, um, with one in about 2,850. Overall for Auckland and the northern region, it's about um, it's now under one in five thousand. <coughs> So one of the questions was, what does next year look like? Um, and it's an easy question to ask, very difficult to answer. Uh, so I just want to walk quickly through two methods. One, a national method top down, which has been done by Tapuna Matatini, and one, a local one that um, Dr. Gary Jackson has put together for us. Oh, and by the way, Omicron. I'll come back to that very briefly. So this is the, um, this is the Tapuna Matatini uh, summary. So these are the assumptions that went into it. Most of the assumptions here uh, have actually held. This was work that was done sort of um, in the earlier part of the year. The only uh, point which is possibly uh, going to change is that um, the assumptions were that the Delta variant would be the main circulating virus, which I think is unfortunately not going to be the case. <clears throat> Again, lots of, uh, lots of numbers on here, but this is just to show how the model is put together. So you have vaccination rates by age and ethnicity. You combine them all in a matrix to give you the number at the bottom here. So this is uh, assuming a 90% pop uh, coverage for the county's population. Um, important to note that <clears throat> at the moment, uh, that would equate to a 73% coverage for all ages, which um, <clears throat> uh, because of the proportion of the population that's under the age of 12. That model has been built into a national um, tool, which all DHBs can access, and you can play with the um, the different scenarios in here, which is um, which is quite quite helpful. So that's the first method. The second method is uh, a more recent one that uh, Gary's been working on, which is to look at uh, what's happening uh, and what has happened in Auckland in November. <clears throat> Again, just sort of focus on the two figures here. So this is the not fully vaccinated figure for the month of November. So you can see um, infected per month for Māori, the curve here, Pacific and other. Note the scale from the sort of 0 to 5% of the population. Compare that to the fully vaccinated infection rate and the scale here. Um, so really sort of pointing out the impact of vaccination, um, but also built this is able to build in the, the big differences between vaccination rates uh, across ethnicities and the uh, experiences that we've had in this outbreak. So 12 fold difference um, an infection rate uh, in uh, unvaccinated between Māori and European and fivefold between Pacific and European. So if we take those, this is what we might expect to see. So <clears throat> basically looking pretty good through summer and autumn and then peaking with the rest of the winter viruses in July and August. Um, but the good news is if this, if some of these assumptions hold it would be very similar to uh, maybe a little bit higher than the peaks that we've seen this month. Um, again, uh, expecting those to, to fall largely in Māori and Pacific communities uh, with a, a lesser proportion of other. Um, and that's just looking at the same graph, same shape, but by vaccination status. If you look at hospitalizations, so previous was cases, again, the shape is the same, but you can see that um, the num total numbers is probably the most useful thing on here. So we're looking at somewhere between 500 and sort of 600 admissions per month over the winter period uh, for COVID on top of the other things that we will need to deal with. So just a last um, point on Omicron. Um, yes, that's definitely a cause for concern, not 
no time to go into the details now, but the best evidence currently suggests that it's definitely transmitting more readily in um, both previously vaccinated and previously infected populations, uh, and some emerging evidence that it may increase the rate of hospitalizations in vaccinated people as well. Um, some good news, third dose boosters of the current vaccines do appear to be effective, perhaps not as effective as they were against Delta, but still very effective. Uh, so if you haven't already, get your booster. Thanks very much. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Sue Wells, Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Auckland. She also works at ProCare. And I was delighted when I heard that Sue had been invited to uh, go, around the, go around the world uh, virtually <laughs> and find out um, what's been happening around the world. And she has a pretty optimistic picture for us. So Sue, over to you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Sue Wells aho. Thank you very much, Bruce. So I was asked by NH, uh, NRHCC to do a rapid review of um, overseas models of general practice in the context of endemic COVID. And so what then, and what I did was a literature review with uh, Medline and Cochrane, uh, GP College and government health guidance and protocols and other organisations overseas and um, gathered qualitative narratives from um, 18 GP leaders um, about their lived experiences with um, primary care and how they practice at the moment day to day. And the GP leaders were from England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Denmark, Norway, Israel, Singapore, Canada, and North Carolina. I would have loved to have gone there but in person, but um, they were very generous with their time. The questions that I was asked by, uh, by uh, NRHCC was, what's the ideal balance of virtual to face-to-face to -face care? How are practices balancing COVID-related care and the rest of core primary care? How are they physically managing respiratory illness, red streams? Have they undertaken ventilation intervention, how are they managing vaccination versus non-vaccinated patients in the waiting room, how are they looking after their staff, how are they mitigating um, access barriers to care, and in all those things, what about equity? Um, on top of that, I also just asked three questions to these people, is what worked well? What could have been improved in your country? And what would you advise New Zealand general practices, health services and government policy? And um, so I had a, a month to pull it all together. And um, you're very welcome to the report if you'd like it. But I'm just going to give you some very key um, observations. And, um, uh, and as my husband would say, just give you the skinny. Um, so. The pandemic, you know, is evolving and um, we need to be very aware that it's going to be with us for many years. New Zealand um, is in a very different context than internationally. So with our high vaccination co coverage, we are in much better position than most other countries when they experienced COVID outbreaks in 2020, 2021 with the alpha and then delta in unvaccinated populations. What they say to us is that endemic COVID in the community is vastly different when the population is vaccinated versus unvaccinated, especially who you see with COVID. And um, the English uh, GP leader said that most are not terribly unwell. There will be some that will be very sick, but most not terribly unwell. And also who you will see will be the younger unvaccinated adults as we're seeing from adult um, Andrew's um, graph. Vaccination for five to 11 year olds, that big pool of non-immune um, population that we have, um, would, um, it has started for Israel, Canada and Denmark. And um, they are experiencing surges in their COVID rates. Um, because they, as they say to me, that pr the primary course of vaccination alone is not enough. They all celebrated when they had very high vaccination rates, and then the surges came with waning immunity. So we all need the boosters, and that's going to be really much part of our year next year. Um, 
they also said to expect, just expect case numbers to go up. Um, when countries start to restrict, um, to sort of um, not to ease up on the public health restrictions, when the borders open, when social gathering sizes increase, when there are indoor events, then that will result in increased case numbers. But much more is known about how to stay safe than at the beginning of the pandemic. And public health measures are extremely important. So they talked a lot about being consistent with simple public health actions, mask wearing, stay at home if you've got a cold or you know, um, get a test, uh, ventilation, open the windows, meet outdoors, hand hygiene. And some places are now rein reinstating the um, mask use outside, outdoors or out in the community because they actually uh, got rid of that and found that it's a respiratory virus and that's the way it travels. So they're reinstating mask use. So uh, when I asked them at the time of the interviews, uh, Denmark, Singapore and Ireland, all about 5 million people, had between two to four and a half thousand new cases of COVID per day, per day. Now, Andrew was giving you um, a graph which is talking about four to five thousand cases per month is what we were looking at next year. So um, when I talked to them, they were incredibly relaxed about the whole thing. We would think, gosh, that's huge. So um, just Israel, they, uh, the guy, uh, the doctor said to me, um, in Israel, we had 10,000 very sick people per day, and now it's 500 per day who are relatively okay. You know, they've got a, a, a mild to moderate viral illness. So for them, uh, for all of these countries, the situation feels under control, and they're getting on with core primary care. The other thing that they're doing is that testing facilities are still free and very widely available. Practice precautions, and I know Sally is going to be talking about this very soon, but for them, for the most part, was telephone triage, if the patient's symptomatic, advise a, P a PCR test, asymptomatic patient wears a, a, wait, a mask in the waiting room, practice staff just wear a mask, with the ability, if they're caught out by somebody a walk-in or a patient not recognizing these symptoms, to don extra PPE if necessary. They did not undertake any extra measures for ventilation, other than if they had an HVAC system, they would get it maintained or open windows or do as much as they could with um, good ventilation. They said now in this current context, next to zero health workers get COVID-19 through work. They get it when they're out visiting their friends at a cafe, indoor cafe, and they take off their mask. And, and, and so that was their observation. Virtual versus face-to-face. -face. They all did that dramatic shift to virtual. But the balance has shifted right back with um, endemic COVID. Denmark and Israel reported that they were back to normal face-to-face -face with offering telehealth if, if required. Canada and US, 70% face-to-face now, 30% virtual. UK GPs are less, around about 50 to 60% face-to-face. Um, GP college documents have moved away, this is internationally, and moved away from virtual first where possible to an approach that now considers patient preferences as well as clinical need. Um, so lastly, what worked well for them? Uh, vaccination, vaccination, effective knowledge management. Uh, GPs get bombarded by messages from multiple sources, don't duplicate. Keep it simple, filter the messages for practices, what is relevant um, to um, what practices need now, hopefully one website. The advice was to do preventive care now while it's safe. They consider where we are is incredibly safe 
get all the preventive care, long-term condition care done now. The advice was if anybody has a cold, upper respiratory infection, any um, and test is and test negative, stay at home until the symptoms clear because they're seeing a resurgence of flu and RSV um, with people doing a rapid antigen test negative and then going off to work, going off to a party, going off to a reunion. Um, actually, there's heaps more, but what I will do is stop now and answer questions as they come through. And uh, hopefully that's within my 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. That was bang on. Um, so our next uh, two speakers are Daniel Calder, Clinical Director of East Health, and David Harrison, PHO Nursing Director for East Health. Uh, East Health. Uh, they're going to ask about screening and streaming. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you, Bruce. Tanakoto Katoa. Thank you very much, Susan, for your run through of the international literature and talking to people that are working overseas. I think it's so valuable to learn from um, the experience outside of New Zealand. And I think we've been in an incredibly privileged position uh, in New Zealand with elimination strategy that it has brought us time. And that's why we can um, take a bit of uh, reflection time to see what has worked overseas and to tweak what we're doing here in New Zealand. We're just going to quickly run through screening and streaming really from a practical point of view. And the key thing to get across is that although elimination has been extremely successful for New Zealand, we are no longer in the elimination phase. So uh, that's something that I think all of us in healthcare understand, but we may not have implemented the next phase. So if you um, are still really doing the same things that you did in the beginning of the pandemic, then you need to rethink and see whether it is time to shift. And really when we're looking ahead at 2022, we do need to do things a bit differently. So this uh, image here is how some of our patients perceive us. I don't think that many clinics now actually have padlocks on. Uh, and fortunately, that was only ever happening in some real rare instances. But we need to break that perception that some of our patients still have, that it is challenging to get in to see us, that there are a lot of barriers. So it's no longer a physical padlock, but, but it perhaps is a mental barrier that we have to overcome. So why do we do screening? Um, yeah, it is to protect staff, but it's actually more about protecting patients now. So all of you will be double vaxxed. A lot of you will be triple vaxxed. We know from overseas, but also now in New Zealand, that healthcare workers do not uh, get COVID from patients when the patient is wearing a mask and you as the healthcare professional wears the mask, that is not how you're getting it. It is in the lunchroom, it is out socially uh, that people get it and can then bring it into the workplace. But we need to think about our patients, particularly the vulnerable patients, also the um, unvaccinated patients, which I would now consider a, a marginalized group of people that we need to really make sure are not missing out on healthcare. We want to make sure that we can operate GP clinics without closure. That's much easier now. Public health is operating according to a completely different uh, risk matrix to what they did in the beginning. So although there were some clinics that had to close their doors for a few days in the beginning of the pandemic, that's not happening any longer. So you can have uh, COVID positive patients that are coming through into a green stream environment, and it does not mean that the whole clinic shuts down. It is good to use screening as a way of deciding is telehealth going to be helpful or not, but we need to shift from trying to push everyone into telehealth and now offering it as a choice. So let the patient guide us on this. They have lived through this as much as we have. They know about telehealth options by now. If a patient wants to come in person, it is really important that we allow that. And what we mean with the real agenda, I think all clinicians are familiar with the scenario. A patient comes in with something really mundane, but actually they have another issue that they just didn't feel comfortable discussing, either with our receptionist, even with a triage nurse, 
or with a GP on the phone. Sometimes they just need to build up that rapport that can only happen in person. So if you do screening uh, with a bit of care, it can be done and it's not a barrier to access. But if we do it um, in the same way that it was done in the very beginning of the pandemic, then we do risk uh, causing some harm. So when would you screen? Essentially, there's multiple uh, times when it's appropriate to screen. One is on the portal, and you might want to just double check the questions that are on the portal and see if they're still fit for purpose. On the phone, um, in the front of house area, so when people approach the clinic, and you can consider whether a patient declaration form is helpful. But in all of this, you're essentially looking at two big elements. So one is symptoms of COVID-19 and the other is exposure risk. So we'll just very briefly drill into that. So when we're screening for symptoms, you'll see that it's primarily looking at the respiratory symptoms. So it's respiratory, sore throat, fever. That's really what we're asking. Now, what we're not necessarily needing to ask so much any longer would be the atypical symptoms. So you'll be aware that some uh, patients do present with atypicals. It can be things like just nausea, it can be abdominal pain or other GI symptoms. Firstly, a lot of times they will also have a respiratory symptom. Secondly, we're now really, if we're looking ahead at 2022, probably in a position where you need to have tolerance for the idea that a COVID positive patient can actually sneak into your brain stream with your best endeavors and it is not a disaster. So um, I would say focus on the main symptoms, focus on the respiratory and then the smaller print, the atypical symptoms, accept that some patients will have that in the same way that we will have the occasional asymptomatic patient that comes through, gets seen in green stream, and later on turns out to have COVID. What you can do within the green stream is, of course, change TAC if uh, it turns out that a patient has concerning symptoms, and that's when you would up your PPE if needed. So I'm not going to go through this slide in a lot of detail, but that's the exposure risk questions, and they do seem a bit repetitive. However, by testing over time, these are the questions that have been found to really make sure that people get a chance to think about uh, all the possible exposures. All of these questions are available on the um, health pathways, and it's really a good idea to use the questions that are there and maybe replace some of the questions that you're using in, in your clinics if they haven't been updated for a while. So I'll hand over to David for streaming. Thank you, Kia ora koutou, um, and uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, uh, I think what we're seeing, what we're hearing is an enduring theme coming through this evening, and, it's, uh, and I think it's quite deliberate that that is happening. Um, and I think what we're also seeing is, uh, is uh, hopefully a concerted effort to say that business as usual and COVID is very much the new normal. Um, and in respect to streaming, um, and reflecting on uh, Sue Wells' presentation earlier as well, uh, what we ought to be doing now um, is, um, is taking a step back, accepting that we are in fact in a, in a very fortunate place um, and pushing as hard as we can with as much effort as possible uh, to be getting on with the uh, support and management that our patients have been denied for quite some time. And when I reflect on the locked door and padlock, I think for our clinicians and our healthcare teams as well, we've been hiding behind the locked door and padlock uh, as a, um, a, and that in itself, I think, has been a barrier as much as that as perceived by the patients themselves. Um, so as we go forward, I think what we can, um, what we can do this evening is really just look at, um, at options that you might want to consider in the patient environment in which you operate. All of our clinics and care centres will be different, but really, Predominantly ensuring that your patients are wearing a mask uh, should be the rule of thumb across the board, and we'll continue with that theme, I think, going forward. Um, streaming to separate areas, depending on the assessed level of risk, uh, will continue to uh, be an enduring theme going through within that red and green stream discipline. Uh, but take a look and take a stock take and reflect on where you are in uh, the way you operate at the moment in your clinics. So look at your red streams. 
take the time to look at the entrance and the waiting room, ideally looking uh, to see whether that can be separated out. Uh, if not, uh, escort the patient to a red stream consulting room, but be quite directed about the direction of travel that your patients are taking. Um, look at the high risk people who should not be exposed to each other to prevent cross infection and you are continually looking at that cross infection risk. And then take a moment as well as you do in your clinics to, to look at the options, you know, can we include asking patients to wait in their car, uh, as has been very successfully been worked as models across clinics and sites in Auckland, um, and in terms of vaccination activity as well, and continues to be um, a, a very good mechanism. So for those patients who then have had a consultation time, maybe have had a vaccine, so now just looking at, uh, so long as there's no clinical concern about waiting time uh, uh, for those unobserved, uh, measure that risk, risk assess. Um, consider scheduling patients with respiratory symptoms during a designated time. So you might want to consider, okay, we could see these people towards the end of the day, uh, if possible, and look at that kind of activity around a red stream. Take the time to look at the consult room itself, and we'll be talking more as the theme of this evening's sessions go through around the environment in which you operate. Dedicated red stream where possible with good mechanical or natural ventilation. Um, and if not available, consider a HEPA filter for the red stream and the, the mixed room environment. So if you think of those patients that we're really wanting to get through our green stream, um, that would be the, the main entrance, the ease of access to these people, identifying those that might be the very young within this cohort, uh, those less than six months, elderly, the frail, those immunocompromised um, uh, patients, uh, and fast tracking those people through. So the other green stream um, can be then at that designated area that can be the main waiting room. Um, think about the distance between uh, those uh, spaces that you occupy your patients for some time. So the one meter physical distance would be the um, would, would be a required rule of thumb. Aim to push out to two meters where possible if your clinic environment uh, allows that. Um, if you think of your um, your treatment room areas, you want to be looking at the consult room and the um, uh, treatment rooms being minimally equipped. So trying to ensure that you can surface clean and decontaminate that environment quickly and effectively. So this risk assessment um, uh, matrix here is uh, just an opportunity, clearly without drilling down to the detail, uh, for us to take a look at the environment in which we are supporting our patients at the moment. Good news, of course, with this is that um, it's a couple of clicks away from access via the community health pathway. So really a great opportunity during your huddle, during the time in which you're considering your patient activity going forward, particularly into 2022, uh, to navigate your teams through the community health pathway going forward. Now, I, um, I cannot resist, of course, with my old infection French control hat on to just finish off and sum up with, uh, and I don't expect you to read or go through all of this slide, but I think the important rule of thumb with all of this really is that we, we need to reassure our healthcare colleagues that by maintaining good infection prevention control practice and optimal hand hygiene and the correct donning and the doffing of PPE, that we are, as Sue Wells mentioned in her reflections, uh, not putting healthcare workers at risk, hence such low level of risks globally where healthcare workers have become infected because with a good cornerstone of infection prevention control in place, um, we can be absolutely assured that that risk is significantly low. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much. A um, lot, of, lot of important stuff there. Our next speaker is Sally Roberts. She's the clinical lead uh, microbiology at Lab Plus, Auckland District Health Board, and she's the chair of the Ministry of Health IPC Technical Advisory Group. And she's going to talk about PPE guidance for 2022. Over to you, Sally. Can I go to everyone? Um, I'm actually going to take you back to basics, but first of all, I'll get my slides up. There we are. Great. So um, I, I've spent most of the last two years uh, discussing infection prevention control issues at a um, national level 
Um, and one of the uh, issues that I've noted is that a lot of people don't really understand the basic science behind um, respiratory particles. So I'm just going to whip you through this um, first of all. And uh, this is an article published by a group of aerobiologists in science earlier this year. Um, what happens when we um, air moves across a moist surface such as the lungs or our um, upper airways, this is a shearing force generated. And depending on the speed at which the air comes out, um, the shearing force will produce particles of different sizes. Now these um, particles, depending on where they're generated from, will have various degree of viral load associated with them. Um, and as they move out from the upper airways, you can see the graphic representation there of small and large particles. And the larger ones, which are about 100 microns or so in size, tend to fall quite quickly to the ground. But the smaller ones will continue on the projected uh, direction of the exhaled plume. The velocity which they come out at very much depends on uh, whether someone's speaking, speaking loudly, or whether they're related to a cough. During their passage as they move away from the source, the smaller ones will collide and become bigger um, by um, combining, and then some of them will drop to the ground, but they'll continue um, moving away from the source. They will uh, evaporate depending on what the temperature and the relative humidity in that uh, environment is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then the um, person who isn't wearing a mask and um, isn't practicing good um, infection prevention control will be exposed to these particles. And by the, the further away you get from the source, the smaller the particles will be. And the, these small particles are inhaled and distributed further down our lungs. They're not trapped by the ciliated epithelial cells because they're too small. Um, and if, if the site they end up in has the receptors for the virus, the virus will bind to them and um, infection will ensue. So um, you have a sense that these virus particles can survive for long periods of time in the, in the environment, um, but that's not necessarily the case. In experimental models, in still air, so that's in a chamber where there is no air movement at all, these large particles, 100 microns or so, will drop to the ground in about five seconds. The very small ones at 100, uh, at one micron, will stay suspended for you know, up to 12 hours. Now, during that time that they're staying suspended, it doesn't necessarily mean that the virus inside them will remain viable. The, and when we get into a realistic environment, like a general practice or um, outside or in an emergency department in a hospital, you've got this sort of other environmental factors that will impact on size of particles and also survival of virus. So you have the velocity of the surrounding air, outdoor wind speeds, even um, having doors that open or a window that will open that will bring air in, and indoor air currents. So people moving up and down corridors will generate air currents and um, support movement. Also, the um, velocity that the exhaled um, humid respiratory plume comes out at. So a cough or a sneeze will generate much greater velocity um, than someone talking loudly on their cell phone and the particle sizes I've just demonstrated. But within the environment are a number of factors that will lead to viral inactivation and, and um, coronavirus is um, a virus that doesn't particularly tolerate changes in environmental conditions. So the warmer um, it gets, uh, the less likely they are to survive. And with re um, relative humidity, so as it gets um, a little bit more humid, um, it controls the environment, the evaporation of these particles. So really we want sort of dry environments where they uh, desiccate. Um, there's the physical fate that occurs with them colliding with one another and getting bigger and falling to the ground. And then there's the chemical microenvironment that exists within that um, viral particle. So different proteins um, and enzymes produced in the respiratory secretions they all um, can impact on the viral survival. But, but, but things like UV radiation are um, particularly effective at killing it. So UVC will kill um, viral particles in about six and a half minutes. Um, and as I mentioned, the chemical composition of the fluid 
um, containing the virus also on packs on it. So I would come to personal protective equipment and I've probably shown this picture um, many times in the last year and a half. PPE is the least effective form of infection prevention and control. It's what we do to protect ourselves when really we should have had all these other measures in place to be uh, more effective. Elimination, you know, we've just heard, um, heard about your screening, how that happens, engineering controls, um, substitute, going back to substitution, that's virtual um, or telehealth, engineering controls, you know, trying even just as simple as opening windows um, and getting the air moving through a practice and then the, um, all the policies and procedures we have in health. So the critical thing is to risk assess every clinical encounter, and it's not something doctors have particularly um, done that well at. They tend to just sail on and to see the patient, not really thinking about what harm um, this patient may pose to them. So the fact is to consider, uh, is this a um, patient high risk of having COVID infection? Are they a close household contact and are they symptomatic? And if they're symptomatic, they'll have a high viral load. Um, and they're going to be more, more likely to be dispersing that with every respiratory effort. Um, how long are you going to spend with them? Are you going to be in there for 15 minutes in the same airspace or less? Um, is your room well ventilated or not? And is the support person that's come with them, are they unwell as well? So you might have two people producing infective respiratory particles in your room. And then the key issue is um, respiratory protection. And uh, the last two years have been the great debate over medical masks versus particulate respirators. Now, medical masks are, are designed and they to adhere to a standard, so they protect um, people from uh, large respiratory particles. But particulate respirators are designed to stop you breathing in particles, whether it's a respiratory particle or a dust particle or um, any other chemical toxins in the environment. And they, they do that by being sealed, so tightly sealed to your face so that nothing can come in the sides. And then there's um, gowns, gloves, and eye protection that uh, we recommend wearing um, as well. Uh, this chart, which is just released, I think on the 3rd of December, um, actually took quite a long time to reach um, the present state, because we debated at length um, what sort of guidance we would pri um, provide for the pri primary and the community health and disability sector. We wanted, we understood that um, there was variation across the country about um, whether um, there were cases in that community or not, um, whether there were um, ways that we could um, Risk assess, we had to get rid of the HIST criteria because that, you know, um, seemed to have, we've seemed to have moved on from that, although the, gui the guidance still had it in it. So um, over a period of weeks of going backwards and forwards over this, we sort of came up with what we're calling the sort of traffic light system, although terms like sporadic cases, increasing cases and widespread cases don't really um, define the situation at the level that I know some of you would like. Um, but this is so that we have done some general recommendations and you can adapt them for your particular situation. So even within the Auckland region, there may be variation in um, the risk of people that you're seeing and the various PPE that you need. And we just really shifted from um, ha ha having the alert levels to, to the traffic light levels. And then we've just said, well, lower risk of COVID, moderate risk of COVID, or a higher risk of COVID and try to put the PPE um, there. There's always exceptions. So if you are in a particularly poorly ventilated room, um, it's a room that gets stuffy in your primary care practice and no one particularly likes to be in it in those hot, humid days in Auckland. Um, that, you, know, you might think, well, what can we do to improve the ventilation in this room? Or could this room be used for some other purpose that I'm not going to put a high risk um, patient into it? If you, if you are going to be seeing high-risk patients, and these are really um, ones with symptoms and identified as close contacts um, until their test result comes back or no in COVID positive patients, then you do need to protect yourself against small respiratory particles that remain uh, suspended in the air. And that requires you to wear a particulate respirator 
And to wear a particulate respirator, you really need to be fit tested to make sure you can fit it properly. And I think I'll just stop there and um, answer any questions that come up. Okay, thank you very much, Sally. Um, covered some important things there. Our next speaker is Dr. Alistair Sullivan, Director of Urgent Care Tamaki Health. He's going to talk about managing the built environment in 2022, ventilation and other options. Over to you, Alistair. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, Tina Koto. Um, look, um, uh, Stuart asked me to share, I guess, what you'd call um, the Tamaki Health experience of uh, improving ventilation and the journey to do so. Um, like I'm sure many of you, uh, as far back as June or July this year, we became increasingly aware that um, there was um, um, uh, good um, advice from overseas, particularly from, particularly from the CDC and the WHO, that we should assess and ideally improve ventilation in our clinics to uh, minimise or add an additive effect to the existing uh, protection that we had uh, for our staff and patients against COVID. And whilst um, organisations like, say, for example, the College of Urgent Care came out with a, uh, a recommendation that we improve ventilation and um, uh, consider the installation of HEPA filtration units, high efficiency, particularly air filtration units, um, there wasn't much guidance from either the Ministry of Health in New Zealand or really clear um, guidance on how we should do this. So um, we were a bit stumped and uh, eventually I um, asked uh, Christine, who um, very kindly put me in touch with um, a couple of key people, Elizabeth Somerville, who's a, a NIWA air quality science, scientist, and uh, Penny Nee from the University of Auckland. They were really helpful at sort of giving me an overall picture of the challenges um, and actually some of the solutions and, and pointing me in the direction of some webinars around uh, ventilation assessment and improvement and also um, some external guidance and such as the, particularly the uh, IEA, the International Energy Agencies, who have a COVID-19 uh, ventilation resource within um, their uh, air infiltration uh, and ventilation center. So, you know, they would be in further directions uh, around some of the, the, the guidelines that are particularly useful from the UK, such as the, the, the Health and Safety Organization, um, equivalent of our work safer, HSE and um, the SAGE recommendations, for example, and also the um, uh, called uh, SIBSE, which is their Institute of um, uh, uh, Building Engineers. Um, and they've got some really good and sensible and simple practical guidelines on how to assess ventilation and what simple improvements you can do to, to um, do to alter your, your built environment. And I guess sort of um, from our perspective, we're, we're a group with we've got 55 um, general practice surgery care clinics uh, around the country, but predominantly um, in Auckland. And I guess like many of you, we've got a range of uh, environments from one or two main general practices um, wooden villas um, with sash windows and, and old-fashioned doors and no air conditioning whatsoever to buildings where they're, they're reasonably modern but have had retrofitted um, uh, air conditioning systems put in place through to more modern or nearly new buildings with perhaps only a year or two old with um, purpose-designed HVAC systems in, in them and trying to get, that, get our head around um, what were the differences and similarities where we could apply a common approach um, was quite challenging until we really started to, to read some of the guidelines that were that were that were around, um, and it, it, it actually wasn't that difficult. We started off by getting some formal audits from um, some um, air ace uh, engineers who are the, the New Zealand equivalent um, of the uh, HVAC engineering uh, group in the uh, in the UK, and and a, and a full um, ventilation audit really. Um, is about uh, measuring over at least 24 hours in multiple sites in multiple rooms, uh, uh, basic um, things such as CO2 level, temperature, humidity, and particulate count, and then seeing whether that changes um, if you do something later, like put in a uh, HEPA filtration unit or with um, different uh, volumes of occupation on different days of the week. So we started out doing that on a, on a Monday, our busiest day at one of our urgent care clinics. Um, and we measured, we got the them to do that formally. And what we realised is um, after we, we did that and we talked with them, that actually there was a lot of stuff that we could do ourselves, um, particularly in terms of assessment of 
um, of a clinic, or whether it's a general practice or an urgent care clinic. And really, you've got to start with doing a simple room by room assessment, going going through each room and, and, and understanding what um, natural ventilation there is, and can you improve that nat natural ventilation? Which, of course, is basic doors and windows. If you've got windows that are open, then you should open them. It's as simple as that. If you've got windows that 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 can't open, you need something else to improve ventilation. If you've, your windows do open, do they open only on one side of the building? If they, if that's the case, then there's a bit more of a risk. Although the the, the two on one rule applies. If you've got a, a building that's more than twice the um, the, the depth of, of the height, then there's a restricted amount of ventilation. So you need to put in something like a fan, which directs air to the outside, not through to uh, directly to patients from the areas of lowest ventilation. If you've got sash windows, you open them at the top. Um, there's a seasonal variation if you if you um, if you can you open the maximal in summer you don't need to open things as much in winter because the the temperature differentials and generally the, the pressure differentials in winter create a much greater draft effect with um, smaller amounts of window opening which helps to offset the, the temperature drops that occur with um, significant amounts of window opening so those sorts of things are are relatively straightforward and can result in a significant improvement in ventilation if you've got the ability to open things or at least put fans in place. Um, the, the, the other main thing we learned was around CO2 monitoring as a proxy for ventilation. Um, and and that's, that's something that anyone can do by buying themselves a portable CO2 meter. Like um, pulse oximeters, CO2 uh, meters aren't all created equal. And so you really need the infrared non-dispersible ones, the, um, the equivalent uh, CO2 monitors, which are cheaper are not nearly as accurate or efficient. And, and the, the international guidelines really state that if your um, CO2 part per million are around um, 350 to 450 parts per million in, in the outdoors, um, then you're seeking uh, a, an assessment of adequate ventilation by looking for CO2 levels under 800 parts per million. Between 800 and 1500 parts per million, you're uh, you're in that indeterminate zone and over 1500 parts per million of CO2, you really have got very inadequate ventilation. Um, so it's really around you, you're purchasing a CO2 meter, measuring in, in room by room, which doesn't take long, uh, multiple times in the room and multiple locations in the room. You measure it, um, but use the CO2 meter at head height. You make sure it's nowhere near a window or an open door. And you make sure it's not in a place where someone sits because if you're actually measuring that while someone is sitting there, say, for example, in a waiting room or a consultation, you're going to get elevated or falsely elevated CO2 levels. And it's about the average CO2 level across that space that's, that's really important. Um, you need to measure at least half a metre away from, um, uh, from, from patients, for example. Um, those are sort of some simple assessments in terms of the CO2 metres. Um, the, 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 the next step is to if you've got an air conditioning system to look at it and um, to see whether you can improve it. Uh, the first step is, as I think um, um, someone else mentioned earlier, is, is make sure your, your um, air con, your HVAC system is being well maintained. And you might assume it is, but um, it's really important to check with, if you're not the owner of the building that it has been well maintained. It's the number one thing you can do, cleaning coils, replacing filters. Um, we had a bit of a journey with a number of our um, buildings. Uh, a lot of our um, engineers, our HVAC engineers, had no idea what kind of uh, filters their HVAC systems had in place and whether they could be upgraded. Most of them, once they'd done their research, went, went away and found that they were nowhere near a MERV uh, 13 or more, which is the, the standard of a HEPA filtration unit. And there was very little ability in their view to increase or change those filters because of the extra load that we put on the system. So it was back to sort of some more basic measures. One of the, the basic measures we, we learned from the engineers was make sure that if you have got room controls, tell staff not to turn them off or drop the temperature um, because you'll end up switching your system off and having an area of reduced ventilation as a result of it. So make sure that once you've got your set points, make sure your staff are aware not to change your set points. Um, one thing you can do with many HVAC system increase the percentage of outside air that the system draws in. Many of those are, um, are variable and can be increased. And increasing the amount of outside air is the, probably the single thing you can do with an existing HVAC system, which will improve ventilation. Um, so those, those kinds of um, 
So basic things uh, then lead on to, well, okay, if you, you've done your maximum, you're still fine, you've got inadequate ventilation, or in our case, we wanted to consider bringing people back into our waiting rooms. Um, and we had some areas where there was inadequate ventilation um, very clearly. Uh, we looked at the, um, the high efficiency, particularly airport craters, and the College of Care or the CDC, the, um, there are a number of, uh, of websites which give you good guidelines about how to assess what kind of HEPA filter to use. We settled on one. We're currently, we have around about 100 units um, across 15 clinics, and we're expanding that. Um, the, uh, they have a good um, cleaning of delivery rate, which means we can get uh, between four and six um, total air changes of room air um, uh, through the uh, HEPA filtration. There are some basic things you have to be aware of. So, uh, so th that's what we're doing, and we're continuing that uh, that journey and roll out. Have to answer questions later on that. Thank you very much. Ventilation's a, a, a issue we don't normally have to think about in primary care. So that's there's some quite interesting things that have come up there. Our next speaker is Dr. Christine McIntosh. She's the clinical co-director of Final Home Quarantine at NRHCC. Christine's going to talk about. COVID case management in 2022. Over to you, Christine. Thank you. Um, gosh, it's quite dense learning tonight, isn't it? Um, one after the other. Um, and Alistair, what an expert on air conditioning you've become. Um, so uh, I was asked really to put together um, some slides that would help um, really around the understanding of uh, where the Fano HQ program is. Um, for those that are not aware, Fano HQ is now the name for community isolation and quarantine in Auckland. And this was a name that was um, decided um, by our community and by our Māori providers to really, um, and uh, our Māori teams to really reflect what is happening with home isolation and quarantine. So just really um, uh, um, describing where we've got to with the Fano HQ, um, really our focus is very heavily on equity. And as Andrew um, pointed out in his slides, um, COVID is really affecting our Māori and Pacifica communities. It's affecting those people who are not yet vaccinated. And it's really important that, um, that we are focused around what is a good model of care for Māori and Pacifica uh, families out there in the community. So it's, that's a really big focus of our programme. Uh, we're also really um, aware that it needs to be uh, a programme that is focused on preventing death from COVID, but also preventing long-term disability. So these things are really important, but it's also important that we do that in um, the context of uh, having really good public health measures and containing the spread of COVID. And um, that... Uh, in fact, we have um, an, an enable resilience within the healthcare system. And, um, and I did see a comment from somebody there about how do we do this in amongst all the other primary care stuff that we need to do. Um, and I will talk about that in a bit of, in a minute. And yes, again, equity. Equity is really, really key to this. Um, this is a really neat and tidy looking model of what about what Fano HQ looks like. Uh, and essentially it goes from somebody having a positive COVID-19 test. And what has been an established model over the last um, nearly two years is that that creates a public health notification and that results then in the public health unit ringing the person and telling them they've got COVID-19 and uh, establishing that contact tracing interview. Um, they are then referred uh, either to an MIQ or to community isolation and then uh, that then leads to the personal health and welfare assessment and ongoing monitoring and then release from the public health process. So that looks all very tidy, but the reality has been that it's not quite like that in actual reality. So the reality is, is that there is an initial call and in that initial call, um, there is an initial health and welfare assessment that is done by the public health team. Um, and uh, so that, that they do uh, uh, understand the immediate needs of that person. Um, however, that's not the primary focus of that call. The next bit is to establish the close contacts and who's in the household bubble. And this has become a really critically important part of this, especially when people, um, what, it has been all along, but it's especially important to consider when people are isolating in the community and there are particular 
um, um, tricky things about this because you need to consider about what it means for COVID for the entire household, not just the case that you've got on the phone at that moment. Um, and then there's initial part of saying, actually, um, from that initial interview, how frequently will this person need um, review? And I, I would say somebody's also commented here, why do we need to do a daily review? Well, partly that is because of our public health response. And that is that we need to do the daily review. So we need to know when somebody doesn't have any symptoms anymore because that affects the time that they can be released from, um, from isolation if they're a case. Um, it's also really important to know when people get symptoms if they're a contact because that's the time at which you need to go, you know, they need to get a test for COVID as well. And that um, the sooner they can get a test for COVID, the sooner they can be released at the end of their illness from, from, um, from their isolation period. So from that initial call, the next things that occur are really there are, are, are four main components to the care. And one of those is establishing welfare needs, because it's really important that we meet the welfare needs of people isolating in the community so that they can um, isolate effectively. So that is about having uh, making sure that they have got food to eat, um, making sure that they maybe need to get their scripts and things delivered. Um, it may be other things that might be actually sorting out some more complex issues, maybe even about animal welfare. If you're a farmer, who's going to look after your animals while you're unwell? The important part, of course, that primary care are particularly concerned about perhaps is the health care and the escalation of care when people are not very well. Another component of it, and I think this is where we're quite different from other models overseas, where there wasn't such a high uh, public health response, is the need to schedule the contacts testing. And um, that's actually quite complex in itself because that scheduling of testing for those contacts changes every time you get a new case in the household. So there is a recalculation as well as soon as you get any new cases in the household. So there are these sort of components of the care that you provide for COVID care when you're providing that for people in the community that perhaps people hadn't really considered. So um, you won't be able to read all the complexity about this, but this has been prepared by my colleagues Stuart and Lily and NRHCC. And this really describes the complexity of those cases and contacts through the home isolation process. And the blue ones are about your cases and they are reasonably straightforward um, because once their cases, their release date is determined by whether or not they're vaccinated and whether or not they have any immuno um, compromise. Uh, but otherwise they're relatively straightforward. But the green and yellow ones there are your household contacts and the green and the yellow ones is the household like contacts. So what we've learned about the outbreak in Auckland is that your household bubble is not typically your household bubble. It may extend over several households. So it's worthwhile considering that. And I think this slide is really just to show you what the complexity actually is. I guess one of the big learnings out of all of this is what we've had to do in doing the um, isolation in the community is we have had to repurpose the public health um, IT infrastructure to do the care in the community because we need to do that dual component of that personal health care, the welfare, and also the public health component of it. And it's really, really important that we don't lose track of people in the system because we have to have a strong public health response. It's really, really critical. And as you've heard from several of our speakers tonight, um, Andrew and Sue and so forth, it's really important that we maintain that strong public health response at the same time. So this is really just to say that actually there are multiple systems. So when the result comes in through eClear, labs through the EpiServe, it creates an NCTS as a contact tracing record. Um, there's a process of that being um, the interview there, but anything that you can see in red there, up until some recent changes or about to go changes, these have all been quite manual processes to hang the systems together, and that has created a great deal of complexity. And to be perfectly honest, it would have been very, very hard for multiple primary care providers to provide care at this point in time, because it would be quite difficult to hold the whole system together and know that we weren't missing people. This is really to give you some idea of the timelines that we're in. 
and to say that while the initial part of this um, uh, COVID care in the community, many will be aware, has been um, predominantly managed by Whakarangaro Healthline um, through um, them being able to rapidly escalate and provide that um, telehealth um, COVID care. Um, we also have uh, two Pacifica providers and um, Māori providers who are also providing COVID care in the community at the moment. And there is an immense amount of learning going on through those Māori and Pacifica providers, including primary care and those Māori and Pacifica providers, about how this process can work in the handover to primary care management of people in the community. Um, it's, so there is a whole lot of work going on with those trials, a lot of learning there. There's a lot of work going on about how to get better IT integration occurring. Um, and also um, thinking about how we bring on primary care practices as a whole. And so we've identified that, um, that rural general practice is um, obviously important and then how we will launch that with further primary care practices. I saw a comment there about whether or not, you know, primary care practices who are already feeling short staffed and not too sure how they're going to manage seven days a week managing to monitor COVID care. Um, and I think it's really important that we recognise that practices do have different capabilities there. And we're very much aware of that at NRHCC and our planning for primary care. Um, just really important that we're sort of thinking through what's required to support all this and the hubs that are required to support that. So uh, this is just a modification of an original slide that we did actually uh, probably about two months ago, and it's really describing the future state in 2022. And um, just saying that actually this is about having overall coordination, but we've got a very strong development of Māori coordination hub and a Pacifica coordination hub and recognising that this is a disease that's particularly affecting our Māori and Pacifica po um, populations, this is really important. We recognise the welfare component with the MSD component there, but actually recognising that we have Māori Pacifica providers as well as primary care providers who will be coming on board. It's very likely that we'll um, continue to have a telehealth component to that, but also recognising that what's developed as hospital in the home and residential housing um, as also being providers who are um, included in this mix. Um, so this is how we see it developing. Um, and, and, and out of this, I think that we have a really strong response and will cope very well with the surge that occurs next year. Um, and yeah, I think that we can leave it at that. Thanks. So thank you very much, Christine. So our last speaker is Dr. Anthony Jordan. He's the Clinical Director for COVID-19 Vaccination Program at NRHCC. He's going to provide an update on the vaccination program. Over to you, Anthony. Uh, kia ora koutou. We just wanted to give a brief update on what the vaccination program will hold for uh, 2022 and what's left in uh, 2021. Um, so I never imagined at the start of the program that we would achieve such high rates of vaccination. I've been consistently surprised at uh, the ability to exceed every time we got over 75, got over 80, got over 85. Um, and now we're sort of uh, forecasting that we'll get over 95%, remembering that the conversion rate for dose ones to dose twos remains uh, exceptionally high at over 97%. Um, and that's a no, uh, no mean feat uh, and uh, down to the significant input from our primary care providers across GP clinics, across Tamaki Makoto. And this hasn't just been about the delivery models that you've provided in your clinics, but all of the other outreach that you've contributed to as well across uh, all the communities that you work in, um, in particular, our Māori Pacific and ethnic communities and those in vulnerable situations as well. Obviously, we've seen a lot of our Māori and Pacific providers uh, maintaining highly targeted outreach activities to get uh, increased rates in our uh, Māori and Pacific communities. And we're still working to get those dose ones and dose twos up. That's definitely a focus for us moving forward. So as we move into five to 11 year olds and boosters pro booster programs, we must remember that we still have dose ones and dose twos to come on board. So focus areas for next year is to continue to support the work being delivered through primary care and their vaccination role. And this is incredibly important in terms of when we think about five to 11 year olds, 
This is a group that historically would have received their vaccinations through primary care. They'll have critical um, trusted relationships with their primary care providers that will be important in terms of being able to ask questions, having those questions answered and being able to comfortably receive vaccination in a place that they go to for their vaccinations usually. Booster doses is a moving feat at the moment. Obviously, Andrew talked about Omicron. So currently we're sitting at six months. However, if you look internationally uh, in the UK, that's come back to three months in Australia back to five months. And currently this is uh, being discussed at MOH level and will be reviewed by cabinet soon. So where we sit at the moment at six months is almost certainly gonna change based on uh, what we're seeing with data on Omicron from overseas. So a really important ongoing um, activity for us is to continue our mobile outreach services, um, looking at pop-up sites. So those are sites, and not just our drive-through sites, but also events that we run and uh, in-home vaccinations remain a, a really important strategy for us moving forward into uh, 2022. So we need to recognize that the reason that we've probably received such great uh, vaccination uptake across Auckland is because we've had a highly flexible model. We've looked at events that work, we've learned from that. Uh, we've looked at different models like drive-throughs, vaccination in cars, at primary care as well. Um, and we re need to reconfigure our staff to look what we may have started out with with our static sites may not be necessarily what we need to deliver the program moving through next year. So we are particularly focused on maintaining our outreach activities to make sure that we continue to reach those vulnerable communities. Another big part that we'll need to focus on is obviously we're seeing vaccination rates for other vaccines like MMR fall off. So we need to look at co-administration of other vaccines at the same time. We will have a flu vaccine come in uh, next year that we'll need to co-administer as well. AstraZeneca is currently being available at some selected sites. Those so sites have been um, chosen across uh, the Auckland region to ensure that people don't have, have to travel too far for that. Uh, so this has opened up a little bit of um, additional people coming on board for AstraZeneca. It hasn't been huge, but we never imagined it was going to be anyway. Um, just an update on five to 11 year olds. Um, so this is already rolling out overseas. MedSafe are currently looking at the data as we speak. Um, we expect to have that approved before Christmas with probably a rollout starting somewhere in the mid January period. Obviously our focus will be deploying that sort of vaccination program through our existing delivery models. And we'll also look at other things like school based uh, campaigns as well, but that's a conversation that we need to have with the Ministry of Education. Obviously, it remains critical that primary care uh, give us feedback on this because this is a piece of work that you've done long before we came into the vaccination game. Um, so what have we got in terms of uh, social media campaigns will be run out uh, with videos, so using um, Māori and Pacific families to tell stories about why they're getting vaccinated and using some of our trusted independent um, uh, health professionals to talk about what the vaccination offers. There'll also be information packs and materials for parents and they'll be made available for primary care and will be available through vaccination centres and schools as well. Similar sessions to what we're running tonight plus Q&A sessions will be available um, both for uh, parents, but also for other uh, groups of people who would like to know more about uh, five to 11 year old vaccinations in particular. And we'll do some more targeted uh, media activity for Māori and Pacific uh, communities as well. And just uh, booster doses in Omicron, I answered a question just before saying that this is a really evolving situation uh, at the moment. Obviously, a two dose regimen um, looks to be not that effective by the time we get out to six months. However, the good news is, is a booster dose does restore this 
to near uh, baseline levels. And it's very hard to predict at the moment what the effect is on hospitalization for an individual. We are starting to see hospitalization creep up um, amongst uh, people in South Africa in particular, and there definitely will be a small reduction in efficacy uh, for people who have had an only a two-dose regimen over time. Um, so just coming back to vaccination, it's still our most important tool that we have uh, to deal with Omicron, and we have to really recognize that uh, in the future that as Omicron looks to be significantly more infective, uh, if it spreads through our population, we will see our rates of hospitalization and severe disease go up, even if there is a uh, ongoing protection from uh, the two dose regimen. And that's it from me, and I hope I kept to time. Very much so, Anthony. Um, so there are some questions there. Um, are there gonna be large vaccination drive-throughs for the five to 11 year olds? We have been focusing on probably more of the event-based based activities with five to 11 year olds. That may be us trying to distract them from what they're being brought along to do. Um, it's a little bit difficult with uh, some younger people to get them into a car and not to jump across the seat <laughs> as they're about to be vaccinated. But yes, they will be able to go to drive throughs Alice, did you want to answer that question about preferred HEPA filters? Yeah, look, I just uh, finished sending something very quickly. There's a lot um, of recommendations there, and hopefully that sort of covers it off. But um, you know, um, as I said in my email, we, uh, my, um, my response, we chose the domestic ones because they did the trick. They were more cost effective, they're easy to place, and um, and basically, uh, um, as long as you've got the re re replacement HEPA filter parts for them available, uh, which is a, another key thing, then, then I would go with the domestic ones. As long as they, you've assessed them properly using, we use the uh, Harvard um, Boulder CU uh, calculator to work out, you know, that it would, uh, it would scrub the air um, for each space we wanted to apply it for. As long as you've done that and they're a fit for purpose, um, then go with those. Make sure you don't, don't buy the flash ones with add on this and add on that. Um, just go for the simple units. Um, that, was a, that was it very briefly. Christine, you want to answer one of the questions there? Yeah, thank you. So somebody reminded me about the Fano HQ information. So that's now all going out. So there's a whole uh, new developed Fano HQ guide that is sent out for both the cases and the contacts and the family. And um, there are translations for that in, in, in uh, being developed. Um, but currently that is um, written in English. Um, and however, that there are um, within our Māori Pacific providers, obviously, but also within Whakarangarau, people who uh, speak um, the various languages in New Zealand who are able to provide um, further guidance on how to use oximeters and so forth. So just reassuring people that there is plenty of help around how to use your oximeter. It is a little bit tricky, I've got to say, the oximeter that the ministry purchased, you've got to read up the other way, which is upside down. It, it tricked a few of us. Anthony, a question there maybe for you. The seven doses per vial makes it difficult to do opportunistic vaccinating and regular clinics while performing regular GP activities. Any likelihood of individual doses going forward? No, that's not in the plan from Pfizer. Um, I think we just have to be pragmatic here. We've taken that into account, especially at this point in the program, that you may only get one, to, one or two people through the door. There's still important vaccinations, and we just accept the wastage. Are we likely to give a second booster pre-winter? Stephanie's got a question. Stephanie's asked lots of good questions tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think, I think it's a really important question. Um, and I do wonder if the, the trial for an Omicron-specific vaccination will probably start somewhere in April and May. And so just wait and see, because I think that's probably what we may need a booster for. And a question there about out of Auckland DHBs and their program for children and other COVID. Any advice for out of Aucklanders? Yeah, I would, you know, it's like so many things is that shared learning is really important in this space. Obviously, we need to um, share the tools that we have. You know, Christine and I working across the 
uh, community isolation space, space as well have shared widely what we've done so that people don't have to start from the beginning, because I think that's a really important feature of um, the learning and evolving system that we're currently working in. And there was also a question about Northland as well that I saw came up. Um, and just to say that it is incredibly important to the Auckland metro region that we extend our support to Northland. We've sent vaccination teams north and we plan to continue to support our Northland colleagues. How do we access updated guidelines for CIQ? in terms of guides around length of isolation, uh, when to discharge, et cetera? Uh, no, good question. So um, there is a health pathways case management um, health pathway, and that is getting updated with these types of information. But we're also developing the concept of a bubble pathway, which I must admit, I haven't quite um, laid out the foundations for at the moment, but that's really what we're kind of needing is to be able to pin those things to health pathways. So uh, rapidly working on some of these protocols, but the Ministry of Health guidance provides that guidance on the bubbles, although it's quite complex. Um, Stuart's uh, bubble diagram, we will attach to the health pathway. We just need to get that change for our unvaccinated people who have to isolate in Auckland for that period of 14 days now. So I think that goes live tomorrow and then we'll get that one up on the health pathway. Maybe one for you there, Anthony, about the under five-year-olds who want to vaccinate the uh, their kids, we've got grandchildren and children we may want to vaccinate. Yeah, um, so that uh, study should be published early next year. Um, I really want to watch and wait and see what that shows. Um, remembering that obviously we're just navigating what Omicron means in this space and very young children. I know it's, a, it's a, an anxious space, but it is a mild illness they're much less likely to be, um, I, let's just wait and see. You know, we really have to balance up that benefit and risk ratio for under five-year-olds. And a, a last question there about what plans do MOE, MOH have for school vaccination program to do five to 11-year-olds um, physically in schools? Yeah, we're just talking through that at the moment. Um, okay. Right, well, I think I'll draw that to a close. And just to thank the panel, I thought that was a, a wonderful performance, just enormous variety. And thank you very much for giving up your Tuesday night to um, help us. And thank the uh, uh, in, NRHCC for uh, putting on this, this webinar. Um, so thank you very much. Um, hope you have a good Christmas. So look after yourself and we'll catch you all next year. Thank you very much. It was good.